So we're going to start again, okay? Did you get that picture? Good. That's good. All right. Just getting you warmed up. See if you're awake. That's all. All right. Are we good? Hit it.
just move through a service. We wait for you, Lord. We want your presence, God. I just encourage everyone to just raise their hands and just say, we welcome you, Jesus. Whatever day you had, whatever week you've had, this is your time to meet with the King. Amen.
Someone you tonight needs to be reminded of who God is. They're looking at their situations and their mountains, and you just need to be reminded that He's a way maker. He's a promise keeper. He's a light in your darkness. That's who He is. That's who He's always been.
Tremble, Jesus. 
phone in my office. Be sure I forget to put it on tonight. <laughs> praise the Lord. Excellent praise and worship. You, you know, real praise will bring joy to your spirit and a solution to your situation. But these guys are up here not to do the praise and worship for you, but for you to follow and serve. I'd like to say good job for all you guys tonight. How about that? Good job. Good job. It's getting better all the time. Nancy, could you go and get my microphone or the office or somebody? Okay, cool. Uh, Bob and Diane Ringer in the house. And we, had a, we, we had something to mail up to you, and now I can save a stamp. And you can come pray over the offering while you're coming to get it, which uh, it worked out really well. Pray long. I need a microphone. So do I. <laughs> but I have it, and you don't. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'll try not to teach, I'll just pray, okay? It's hard. Well, just, so, just one thing. The Lord showed me when I was in uh, praise and worship tonight, I went to the bank, you know, to get some money to, to offer. I had a certain amount that I wanted to offer, and I took a little extra. So he said, no. Give it all. And I looked at him and I said, what do I about my coffee? He said, don't worry about it. You'll get one. That should cover the coffee, right? <laughs> but then he said this. He said, Bob, don't you understand when I tell you to give it and you give it and you can do it? That's a hundredfold seed. That's a hundredfold seed because I was doing what I was told. Not only that, oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> I love to give. I love to give. Cheerful giver. Woo, you got to be cheerful about this. Come on. Come on. Get cheerful. You happy yet? All right. All right. Father, we just thank you that you give us the opportunity to have wealth so that we can sow into your kingdom. And we follow it because of the law that you have set before us. Okay. You know this one, right? Pastor loves it. Right? Summer and winter, cold and heat, seed time and harvest shall not cease. Hallelujah. I got a hundredfold seed here, and I'm so excited. Somebody come and get it. Somebody come and get it. Real quick, 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 quick. Oh, thank God. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Father, that we can give, and we know that it will come back to us on every wave of the move of the Spirit of God. Press down, shaking together, and running over, because we give out of the overflow. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Praise the Lord. Ha, ha. I'm just wondering if Paul can even find my microphone in my office. Oh, look. He plays the drums. He does sound. He plays the bass. He falls in love with the praise and worship leader and marries her so that he can improve his singing. Thank you there, Pete. <laughs> awesome. Hallelujah. I think I'll just put it in my pocket. I don't need to be pretty. It's too late to be pretty. Don't, 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 don't. <laughs> Hallelujah. How do I look? Okay. Awesome. So we'd like to welcome our live stream people and our, and our YouTube channel people. And we're so glad to be in your home. We're doing something on Sundays now this month so that you can get into your harvest season. And so you need to tune into that. But obviously you've tuned into this. We'll try to give you something tonight that you can feed on as well. And I think... Um, I think when Bob prayed over the offering, uh, Genesis 8:22, it just it just it just picked the direction for me tonight, because I've been uh, last Sunday, last last Saturday, Pastor Bob, you can relate to this. I came into the office and I was, I was, uh, not comatose, but I was not alert, and so I sat in the office all morning and couldn't come. I read the first six or seven verses of the book of Haggai, and I was bored stiff with it. <laughs> no, sometimes it jumps off the page, and other times it's like, oh. And so I went home with nothing, and then the next day I ended up teaching on it. 
but it was the direction of the Holy Holy Ghost. And so, so then, and, and so then I went deeper into it, and and uh, I was watching. Uh, are you familiar with uh, Rabbi James uh, Jonathan Can? Well, you know, if you're not familiar with him, you need to get tuned in because end time events, you know, he's right on. Little nuggets like, you know, we were talking about Teshiva on on Sunday. Well, the numerical value of that is 1948 (laughs) when Israel became a nation. And and so those those kind of things will are building blocks to faith. But something that he said um, when I was listening to him last time. He said there's been, you know, three, I think three Jubilees, well, two in his time. You know, obviously, they're 50 years apart, so he hasn't had the third one. But, but Jubilee, the, Jubilee 1967, the Sixth Day War, the Jews came in and captured Jerusalem, and that was significant. And, uh, and when, they, when they came in, there's a, a weekly Torah reading that you do that coincided with the day that they marched into the city. There's just all kinds of little things like that. But something else that he said was this. He said, the last uh, jubilee, they called it the dark jubilee because it's like God hit the reset button and everything goes back to its original condition. That's why you see the world around you getting so pagan. It's, you know, and you can pray against it and you can do all that kind of stuff. I'm not saying, but I'm saying some things that you're praying against are going to happen anyhow. Right. They've been prophesied and the prophecies are going to be fulfilled. Yeah. But the thing that he said about the church and Israel was, our reset is the book of Acts. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And so when you read the book of Acts, I think chapter 4 jumped in my mind when I was thinking about it because it says that they brought so much money that they laid it at the apostles' feet and there was none among them that lacked. So then, so those things always prompt you to take a, a deeper look. And I looked at the Jewish population in the United States is 1.6%. But the billionaires, 20%. Because they're taught, like the church is taught, you know, like I heard this when I first went into the Pentecostal church years ago. You know, God, if, if, if you'll keep them humble, we'll keep them poor. In other words, don't, don't pay the pastor anything because poverty was a, a vow of poverty, a vow of foolishness what it is. But anyway, we know that. But, but what I noticed about the Jews, I was thinking about, I, w- I used to be in the chemical business. Before, I mean, not, the, not when I was doing drugs, but after drugs, I, I was selling chemicals wear wash chemicals and laundry chemicals and things like that. I was known as Sanitary Gary, so. <laughs> and the grime fighter. I was known as the grime fighter. But, <laughs> but this one Jewish guy, I, I, I won't mention his name because he lives right here in the city, but I watched him go bankrupt in a restaurant three different times. And, but it didn't last because the Jewish community kept funding him until he succeeded. No, no, but see, this is the difference between greed and using money as a tool and recognizing what what money's for. The Jewish community recognizes that it's my responsibility to see you succeed and that I'll work 70 hours a week to make sure that you get there, even after I've got all my own stuff. And and so, you know, that's where the church needs to get to as well. I mean, read read Genesis or um, Acts chapter 4. There were none among them that lacked. Can you imagine a church that knows no lack? Huh? What you could do to advance the kingdom. But again, we've been taught, we've got this, well, preachers are just after your money. No, Sobeys is after your money. Uh, Superstore is after your money. You're going to walk up to the checkout and say, well, I know that you just love me and you care that I eat healthy food, so thank you very much. No, there's always a medium of exchange. But with God's medium of exchange, it's so that your plant is... Well, what did he do with Abraham? He said, Abraham, I want you to leave Ur of the Chaldees. What was Ur of the Chaldees? It was the Babylonian system. There's only two systems on this world. The Babylonian system and the kingdom of God. Amen. There's either one or the other. And God knew that he had to get Abraham out of the Babylonian system. 
So he tells him, I want you to go into a country where you've never been. You're not going to have a job. Unemployment rate is really high. And not only that, people aren't going to like you when you get there. How many of you would go? Huh? But read the life of Abraham. That's what he walked into. And, 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 then, and then the Lord said to him, Abraham, you do what I say, and I'll make your name great, and I'll bless you, and that all the nations will, through you, be blessed. Right? So how does that work? I was hoping you'd ask. Genesis chapter 9. Hallelujah. Genesis 9, how many of you know there was a flood on the earth? How many of you know that every historical record from every, every nation, every tribe, every, has a flood in its account? How many, it's all there. I mean, I've been in the caverns down... Well, but let me tell you about Noah's situation. Something I hadn't realized. Uh, we were in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, at Oral Roberts University, and um, we were going through, they've got this place set up, you know, the, a museum set up. We actually get to, to go on a trip in Noah's Ark. And so, first off, you, you walk through the Garden of Eden, and everything is great, and then you find a woman talking to a snake, and I know that's not real. There's not a woman in here that was standing around and talking to a snake. <laughs> you know, it's talking about the M.O. of the devil, you know, sly and slick and slimy. But anyway... You, after after the after no, after Adam and Eve committed high treason, or Adam committed high treason against God, you walk on to the ark. You, you you hear Noah and his sons building the ark, and then they lead you on this tour guide. They lead you onto the ark, and uh, you're sitting on there, and it's about the size of this room, maybe I, I guess. So you're sitting on there, and you can hear all the animals making their noises and things like that, and imagine people cleaning up the mess, and and and. Uh, and, and, then you, and then you hear people laughing and mocking outside. And after that, you hear the door close. And then the laughter gets a little hysterical. And then you hear the rain falling, and the rain falling and falling. And then you feel the ark get picked up, and you're moving. And then, and I mean, darkness in that window up above and all that. And then, a little while later, you see a dove returning and the, the ark settles down. What I was not prepared for was when I got off the ark, the destruction. Like the earth was hit with a major, major, major tsunami, and everything was destroyed. So, so this is where we pick it up in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1. By the way, the ark rested on Mount Ararat, Ararat, and arar means curse, and when you put at on the end of it, it means reversed. So when Noah's ark touched down, it meant the curse on the earth had been reversed. <laughs> so that's a good word for you. It's a good word for you. Amen. The curse, the curse, causeless. Proverbs twenty six two says won't come to you. So okay, so it touches down, and then it says God blessed Noah. Well, do you think he gave him a, a check? Like like, <laughs> how did he bless him? He blessed him with the words of his mouth. He blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them the same thing that he said to Adam and Eve in the garden. Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. How? How? How's that going to happen? Everything has been destroyed. How's he going to do that? With the words of his mouth. With the blessing that was spoken over him that he would continue that blessing. And so, uh, replenish the earth. With that in mind, I, I, I want to turn your attention to um, Genesis chapter 27, I think 27. These guys, the Hebrew people, know the value of words. They, they know that words, Jesus said it this way in John 6, 63. He said, the words that I speak they are spirit and they are life. The words that you speak are spirit and life or, or like he said in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19, I set before you this day life and blessing or death and cursing. Choose life that you and your seed may live. The words coming out of your mouth are either going to bless you or they're going to curse everything that you're working on, the words that you speak. And so God wanted, Ad, God wanted Abraham out of the Babylonian system, and he wants you out too, because the Babylonian system, if you haven't noticed, is crashing around your ears. 
I was listening to Rick Joyner the other day talking about the coming civil war in the United States. Well, it's not hard to believe. It's not hard to believe another civil war will take place with what's going on between the Democrats and the, and the Republicans. I say Democrats because it's so democratic now that this is pathetic. It's not even, you know, talk about drain the swamp. Who knew? Who knew what ugly stuff was down there? I was driving through town today and I saw, I saw on, the, uh, on the back of an, a nice vehicle advertising rainbow child coding. You know what that is? That's where you take your child to, to determine what sex your child is going to be. No, how you check is you drop their underwear and take a look. There's only XX and XY chromosomes. There's no other chromosomes. And so all, but that just goes to show you how far offline the world has gotten. In this city, this is not some other city. <laughs> I don't know what, I mean, how, 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 cool about car shots. Where did I say go? Okay. I'm in 38. Twenty-seven. Genesis 27 is a story that you're probably familiar with of how Jacob stole Esau's birthright, right? But I want you to see what happens here regarding the power of the words. Now, I'm not going to read through the whole story, but you understand that Esau was out in the field hunting and Jacob came in and disguised himself and brought, uh, and brought a meal to his father wanting the blessing of the firstborn. And so he tricked his dad into getting it, right? And so let's see if I can find a place to pick it up here. Verse 19, Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done according to as you asked me to do. I rise, I pray, and eat this venison that my soul may bless you. In verse 28, here he is. He says, therefore God give of the, you the dew of heaven, the fatness of the earth, plenty of corn and wine, and let the people serve you, and let nations bow down before you. Be Lord over your brethren. Let your mother's sons bow down to you, and cursed be anyone that curses you, and blessed be anyone that blesses you. Right? And it came to pass, as soon as Isaac, and, and by the way, as, as, soon as, as soon as Jacob heard, got this blessing, the blessing, I'm messing you up, aren't I, Pete? Was that my heart? <laughs> not as young as I used to be, you know. No, no. Anyway, as soon as Jacob got that word, he ran away. He, he left and ended up over in Laban's, Laban's house. And when he got to Laban's house, Laban, through sorcery, put him back in the Babylonian system. But after he had been there, I think 20 years, he figured it out and broke the curse and, and, and got back into the blessing. But nonetheless, when the word was spoken to him, he received that blessing and waited it out. And so, but, so then Esau comes in. In verse 31, he said, I made savory meat and brought it to you, Father. Let my father arise and eat the venison. Isaac said, who are you? Uh, and look at this. He said, I am Esau, your firstborn. Look at verse 33. How important are words? He, look at this. Isaac trembled very exceedingly because he realized that once he released those words, he couldn't get them back. Life and death, Proverbs 18, 20, and 21. Life and death, it says life and death is not the power of the devil. Life and death is not in the power of God. It says life and death are in the power of the tongue. Do you know what you've been saying? Do you know what you've been creating? Has it been good or not so good? But words, words, words separate you from the animal kingdom. Words put you in the God class. Jesus said, My, the words I speak to you, again, John 6, 63, they are spirit and they are life. And he's saying the words that you speak are spirit. 
They might not be life, but they're words that you speak. That's what meant you are a speaking spirit. And the words that you speak create the future that you'll enjoy or despise. So it's very important to, you know, put a, put a bit in the horse's mouth. James chapter 3 said, put a bit in the horse's mouth because he said the tongue will set on fire the course of nature. That's how powerful your tongue is. He said, your tongue is like the rudder of a ship. You can't see it under the water. You can't see it in your mouth, but it steers you into or out of trouble. And I know this too from growing up on the ocean. I watched the sailboats in the Halifax Harbor, you, you know, and they'll tack against the wind to get out of the harbor. So it, the, the wind direction does not determine where they end up. The rudder does. And so the, it's not the storms of life that are going to lead you one way or the other. It's what you say when they come. Are you saying, thank you, Lord? My God always causes me to triumph in Christ. I just want to thank you, Lord, that I'm steadfast and I'm unmovable and I'm abounding in the work of the Lord because my labor's not in vain in the Lord. I thank you, Lord, that when sickness comes upon my body, I don't rely on science or the Babylonian system. I go to the Word of God and find out what the Word of God says. Go to the Word first. Go to the Word first. I'm not saying he won't use science to help you. We've got witnesses to that right in the building. But I'm saying for God is first. <laughs> No, think about it. He said in Romans 8, 11, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and it will quicken your mortal body. Like you, if you can tune into your spirit, man, it'll heal your natural body. It will. But faith requires corresponding action. So if I really believe that I'm healed, number one, I'm going to have to act like it. And number two, I'm going to have to be, make sure I'm talking it. People saying you're crazy and all that. No, no, you need to, you know, what Romans 4, 17, calling those things that be not as though they were. I'm not saying I'm not sick. I'm saying, saying healing, healing belongs to me. I'm saying healing is the children's bread. <laughs> Amen. And so this is, this is kingdom living. And kingdom living includes kingdom giving. For God so loved that he gave his only. I, I submit to you that until you've given your only, you haven't really given. No, no, it has to cost something. It really has to cost. And again, I, I'm not taking up an offering or anything. I don't want you to think there's any manipulation in that. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 discourages that. Say, so don't give of a necessity or because you've been manipulated. But know this, that the best thing that you can give to God is your whole life. And that includes all the other things. There's things in the Bible that you... you you, you don't understand on the surface because you don't understand covenant. But I mean, I was reading in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 today, and it says that Abraham offered up Isaac, his only, only begotten son. Well, Ishmael was 14 years old when Isaac was born. But there's something about a covenant of promise. There's something about, there's something about in, well. Hallelujah. Let's go to Psalm 8. We don't really have a plan here. We're just... Was Jesus the only begotten Son of the Father? Yeah? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, right? Okay. Okay. Psalm 8, verse 3. These are angels talking, trying to figure out what man is. When I consider the heavens, and Hebrews chapter 2 will tell you about that if you want to read the whole story. We're not going to do that tonight. Just trust me, it's in Hebrews chapter 2 that the angels were talking, and one of them said, what is this man? <laughs> what is this man? I don't understand this man thing. So it says, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have ordained, what is a man that you are mindful of him, nor the son of a man that you would visit him? For you have made him a little lower than Elohim, it says in the Hebrew. That's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Made him a little lower than the angels and have crowned him, but here, crowned him with glory, crowned him with your presence and honored him as well. Crowned him with glory and honor. You made him to have, look at this, made him... To have dominion over the work of your hands. And placed all things under his feet. 
I, I, when I read those things, and now, now go to 1 John chapter 3. First John, little John, back of the book. Verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called what? Children. Sons. Sons. The sons of God, what translation you got? Burn it. Is that NIV? The nearly inspired version? Oh. The NIV, if you got it, burn it. Anyway, so. Oh, it's your favorite Bible? I apologize. <laughs> that we should be called the sons of God, therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. And again, it's not hard to figure out. He was the firstborn among. So if he was the firstborn, then there's got to be a secondborn. There's got to be a thirdborn. There's got to be a fourthborn. You, you fit in there somewhere. And when he says sons, it's not a gender. In the body of Christ, it's neither male nor female, Right? So somewhere in that line, you are a son of God or a daughter of God. And so when you think about that and you think about us returning to the book of Acts, I, I look at where the church is, and I'm not talking about the church here or I'm talking about the North American church in general. We are so far below where we're supposed to be. I mean, he says in John 14 and verse 12, these works will you do also in greater works because I go to my father. Are you seeing that? I mean, you know, a little hit every now and again, but just think of the power that the church is supposed to be walking in and where we are in reality. And so it, 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 something, and I believe this, that we need supernatural help. I believe that in 1948, when Israel became a nation, that the next year and the year after that, the healing revival broke out and it lasted 10 years. And young guys like Kenneth Hagin at the time, Jack Coe, uh, you know, Alan, a. 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 all those guys hit the streets and that revival lasted for 10 years and they said this. They said you could get somebody healed by saying, you know, Mary had a little lamb and Jesus was his name. Yeah. It was easy. Easy. And so believe with me for easy. Amen. We can't work it up, but we can sure expect it. Amen. We sure got to change our expectations. We got to get going on this. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's go back to uh, Genesis. We'll close back in Genesis. I got to get out of here. Can I go back here in Genesis? It's not going to work. If all else fails, go to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Psalm 51. He says in verse 1, Hearken unto me, you that follow after righteousness, you that seek the Lord, and look unto the rock that you've been hewn from and the hole that you were dug out of. In other words, he's saying, look at what happened with Abraham. Abraham came out of the, the Babylonian system, and then if any man be 
in Christ he's Abraham's seed and heirs of the promise. What, what God had to teach Abraham when he took him out of the system was really Genesis 8, 22. You, the Babylonian system is buying and selling and it is so corrupt. I mean, we were coming in the road there tonight and there's some really heavy ruts in the Transcanada Highway because of the trucks being overweight. So then you're thinking, wow, you know, why would they, over, why would they overload their trucks? Well, because they're paying too much money for gasoline. They're paying too much money for insurance in their trucks. And it's not that they're evil or, or anything. It's just that the whole system is against them. And so you see corruption and evil everywhere, but it's because it's the Babylonian system, which is based on greed. Greed, the lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And so God is saying, in order for me to get Abram and turn him into Abraham so that I can get him into a place where he has the faith to offer up his own son so that I can offer up my own son. I need to find somebody on this earth that will offer up their son so that I can offer mine and change this system. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God. And read Revelation 17 and 18. Babylon has fallen, fallen, fallen. The whole system is crashing down around your ears, but the kingdom of God, the stone that the builders rejected has become a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And this is why we need to get these messages over this next month. You need to begin to believe God in a way that you didn't before. You need to believe God for finances like you haven't believed before. You need to believe God that the gifts of the Spirit will operate in you like they never have before. You need to really believe that you're the head and not the tail, that you're above and never underneath. You're really going to have to believe that, that, that with your mouth is blessing and with your mouth is cursing, and you're going to speak nothing but life over you and your situation, over your city. Oh, come on. It, it, it's, it's, it's time to make the shift. It's time to make the change. So he says, this is what he's saying here. He said, he, those that follow after righteousness, how many of you know that's you? He, God, made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that you'd be the righteousness of God in Christ. So you are established in righteousness. When you're established in righteousness, you're far from fear, terror, and oppression. You need to get there because if you don't, if righteousness is not established, faith will never work. Condemnation is the biggest thief of faith that there is out there, and condemnation is a spiritual disease. It's not a natural affliction. Just like the fights that you're into, you want to blame people, but it's not people, it's principalities and powers. There's demons, if you could see them, thank God you can't, but they're there all day long waiting for you to say something negative that they can operate on you against you. They don't have any power of their own. They don't have a birth certificate here. They got no authority here, but they wait for you to say the wrong thing and then they can work on it. But if you order your conversation right, you'll see the salvation of God. That's where I was going to go in Genesis chapter 31 is Jacob knew this, but yet, yet he cursed his own wife to death. Laban chased him across the countryside because his gods were, that he was using against Jacob, witchcraft, his, his sorcery gods were stolen. Rachel had taken them and hidden them in her tent. So Jacob, so, the, so he searched everywhere, but he wouldn't go in Rachel's tent because she said she was on her period and, you know, it's ceremonially unclean, so he didn't search there, but she had them hidden under her saddle. Jacob says this, Jacob was angry. I worked for you for 20 years. You changed my wages 10 times. If I was out and in, in, in one of the sheep died, I, I didn't charge you for it. I, I took it to my own account. You know, he, talk, he said I was out there in the frost and in the rain and snow. He said, I did all that, and now you're here accusing me. He said, cursed be the one that stole your gods. And then his wife died in childbirth because he knew the value of words and used them against himself. Like Moses... Moses, the second time he comes, you know, to bring water out of a rock, he doesn't, he doesn't hit it the second. God told him to speak to it the next time because you're, you're a royal priesthood. You've got the power to speak to these things, Moses. And Moses beat it with a stick and, and got angry and cursed those rebels. He cursed the rebels, and what happened to him? It kept him out of the promised land. Adam and Eve, Adam... Hey, be fruitful, Adam, and multiply and, and, and replenish the earth. You've got dominion over every creep and everything that moves and all that. You, you're, you're in charge. And so, so his wife, you know, she was out shopping, and uh, as women sometimes do. 
And there was this dazzling creature. I mean, if you really read it in the Hebrew, he's a dazzling, one of the most beautiful creatures ever created. He was created as a praise and worship leader in heaven, and he had certain splendor about him. But he's talking to her, and, he's, and he says, are you sure that, that you, you're, you, that you're not allowed to touch this? You, you, if you touch this, you'll become just like God. And, of course, she already was just like God, but she didn't know that. She thought she was missing something. What are you missing? Nothing. He supplied all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Blessed you with all the spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. You just haven't cashed in. You haven't cashed in. You haven't cashed in in the Babylonian system. It's buy and sell. In the kingdom of God, it's sow and reap. And the sower soweth. We use it in finances a lot, but really what he's talking about in Mark chapter 4 is the sower sows the word. The word is the seed. You know, is tithing and giving offerings isn't isn't that either until you until you seize the opportunity to speak life over your finances and trust God for it. So, so where was I? Was I making? Yeah. So so Adam, Adam had the authority in his mouth and he said nothing. So it's not about what you believe. If you're not saying it, believing's not enough. You've got to say it. He had, all he had to say was, Satan, get out of here. And, w- and the Bible would have been two pages long, maybe three. It would have been the sp- shortest book he ever read. Satan came, Adam ran him off, case closed. God comes to him and says, Adam, why are you where you are? Why did you step down from your seat of authority? Why did you move out of Ephesians 2, 6? I seated you in heavenly places in me, and now you're down hiding in the bushes, covering yourself with fig leaves. Camouflage doesn't work with God. No, Adam's authority. So my point is, when you go back to Genesis 9, or back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28, the, the power... God fully expected that Noah was going to replenish the earth, not by getting out with a hammer and nails and planting a garden, by speaking the word and and transforming the area that he was in. Adam was given that job, and, and God showed him the universe, and he was supposed to get that Garden of Eden going where he was and spread it to another planet and another planet and another planet and another planet, and God hasn't changed his mind. He's got you now. But the thing that you need to believe God for is that you are the transformer in your neighborhood. You are the transformer in your church. You are the... Tra- that's, that's why you have to be God conscious and not sin conscious. That's why you have to be righteousness conscious and not guilty. As long as you're not righteous consciousness, you won't have the authority. You won't feel the authority. You won't be able to do anything. As long as you're looking at what you did. Again, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 2. Let's... Can we close there? Just look at a couple of things that Paul the Apostle said about himself. Because you know who he is. You know what he did. He killed Christians. He was a nasty man. He worked havoc all around uh, Jerusalem and Damascus and other places. But I like verse, chapter 7 and verse 2. Are you there? Receive us, we have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. Wait, wait, I know, I know, I know the outtakes. I know, I'm reading the highlight reel, but, but I know the rest of the story. This can't be right. L- look what he says in verse 4. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorings of you. I'm filled with comfort and I'm exceeding joyful in all your in all of our tribulations. So there is a guy, just like Peter, Peter denied Jesus three times. How many of you have never done that? How many of you cursed the woman that accused you of being with him? Cursed the woman. And then 50 days later, on the day of Pentecost, preached a message that got 3,000 people saved. I'll guarantee you that most Christians would not be able to do that. They're saying, well, I'm not, I don't have the right to get up in front of these people. You know what I did like just last month? 
I know that he for, forgave me and cast it into the sea of his forgetfulness, but it's, it's still in the forefront of my mind. Get it out of there. Amen. Get it out of there. See yourself the way that God sees you, the righteousness of God in Christ. What does that mean? I've got a right to stand before God because of the blood of Jesus, Amen. because of what he did at Calvary. No matter what goes on in my life, I've got a right. To, and, then, and, then, and then I need to watch how I, how I pray. Yes. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, please, please, if you could just do this, if you could just meet that financial need, if you could just heal me, oh, God. Hebrews, that's a violation of the covenant. The covenant says clearly in Hebrews 4.16 and in other places, come boldly onto the throne room of grace to obtain mercy, to find grace, to help in a time of need. Don't come like a beggar. You're a son and a daughter. Stop trying to beg God. It's an insult to his character. One more verse. I promise. Well, I'll do my best. Again, I, I want you to see this. I want you to see this again. Numbers chapter 23. If you know it, hear it fresh. This, I call this the linchpin of life. If you'll know this, you'll know life. This is what all of life is built around. This one verse. This one verse. God, verse 19, is not a man that he would lie. How many of you all never told a lie? How many of you haven't even told one yet today? God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of a man that he should repent, or repent simply means change your mind. Repent is tishuva, it means to return, okay? So he says, neither the son of a man that he would change his mind, have I not said and shall I not do it? Have I not spoken it and shall I not make it good? Behold, look at this, I have received a commandment to bless you, and I won't never reverse it. That leads me to one more verse in Isaiah chapter 54. How many of you would like to get home sometime tonight? Okay. No, but Isaiah 54 is powerful too. It will change your life forever. Isaiah 54 will change your life forever. That chapter will change your life forever. Look at verse 9. This is as the waters of Noah unto me. I have sworn that I would no more flood the earth. I've sworn that I would, look at this, I'll not be wroth with you nor rebuke you. Verse 14, in righteousness you shall be established. When you decide to accept the gift of righteousness in Romans 4, 7, 8, 17 rather, when you make a decision, 5, 17, when you make a decision to receive the gift of righteousness, something that you could, a gift is something you just take, right? He said, when you, in righteousness you shall be established. When you get established in righteousness, it'll take you far from fear and terror. They won't come near you. That doesn't mean they won't come around you. It means they won't get in you. Behold, they'll gather together. He's telling them they're going to gather together. There is a devil and he's real and he hates your guts. <clears throat> right? But look at this, verse 17. No weapon. How many weapons? Not one weapon that's formed against you will prosper. When? When you're established in righteousness. When you know that God... See, people get this idea, like I was just talking to somebody earlier uh, today or the other day, that said Job was being tested by God. Well, that means Job, like God came in and killed all of his sons. God came in and destroyed all of his cattle. Like, what? Read James chapter 1. Let no man say when he's tempted, tested, or tried, he's tested by God, for God can tempt no man with evil. No, no. He, he, he was, what he did was he had a form of righteousness. He looked good in church on Saturday, but he was full of fear. Matter of fact, Job 3.25 says, what I have always feared has come upon me. Well, I'd like to twist that around and tell you this. What you have always faithed can come upon you. You know, if the negative is true, then the positive is, is there as well. He feared it. He was in anxiety over it all the time. So, so he was worrying about his kids instead of worrying the word. No, no, get up every day and say, hmm, Ephesians 1.3 says, 
I've been blessed with all the spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. Verse 4 says that God chose me in him from before the foundation of the world. Before I ever did anything right or wrong, God chose me. I'm chosen. I'm a chosen son. I'm a son of God. I'm a son of God. We just read that in 1 John 3, 1 and 2. You're a son of God. Or a chosen in the NIV. Now, Ken Stoddard called it, called it the nearly inspired, and I thought, wow, that's the way I feel about it, too. Because it'll say things in the footnotes, like, this is not found in some uh, translations. But the truth is, in the majority of the ones that count, it is. So it, it, it's, they sow little dote seeds in there. I think it was a colonel guy that translated it anyway. So. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, we better stop. Amen. Yeah, amen. Somebody said Amen. <laughs> That was a loud amen. I want to go home, he said. Come on, Stefan didn't eat supper, maybe. I don't know. He was here practicing. (laughs) Hallelujah. Well, God bless you, and we will see you on Sunday. A couple things we're working on, just to let you know. We're working on bringing Billy Burke in, and and, and on on, um, October the 5th, we have got Gordy Black coming. He is the... United Kingdom president of the tribe of Judah, but that's not why we're bringing him in here, although that's, that's a high honor and he's an awesome tribe of Judah guy. But he also is a Holy Ghost guy. And, and I can tell by looking at you all really need the Holy Ghost, so that's why we're bringing him on. <laughs> Especially Stefan. <laughs> Find somebody new to pick on every week. That's our goal here. We call it edification. Well, bless you and we'll see you on Sunday.